Are we ready, gentlemen? I d honestly, I don't know. Coming up in this week's show... Abby is sideways on ice in a 911 Turbo. Richard drives Jim Clark's beautiful Lotus 25. And I nearly fall over. Right, there's a new off-road four-wheel drive Lamborghini. Uh, it's called the Urus, and to find out if it's any good, I took the Grand Tour to Sweden, armed with some questions. Here's my first big question. If you build a car to tackle terrain like this, can it still be a proper Lambo? Well, the Eurus certainly looks like a jacked up supercar. With its swivel eyed styling, it appears to be every inch a Lamborghini. But is it? Good. Those turbochargers may be a little bit annoying on the road, but here they're giving me the low-down torque that I need to get up this hill. Oh! first Lamborghini to use turbocharging and the first to have an automatic gearbox. And what that combination means is there's a very slight and rather un-Lamborghini-ish gap between putting your foot down and it getting going. And when it does get going, there are no screaming histrionics. Sure, there's a bit of popping and banging from the back. You can't hear that inside where everything is muted and refined. I can see the Pope in one of these. So it's quiet and a bit hesitant. And it has snazzy diffs and a clever traction control system. And the biggest carbon brakes ever fitted to a road car. So it's safe as well. However, there's no getting around the fact that I'm currently driving on snow and ice in a car that has 641 horsepowers rampaging around underneath its bonnet. Which means that actually it's not that safe at all. Go. 
there's no manual locking differentials, there's no low round gearbox. All you can do is fire it up and then put the drive system into snow mode. Oh god, that looks tricky. Well, it does 0 to 60 in 3.6 seconds. And it has a top speed of 189, so it has the performance you'd expect, but there's other stuff you wouldn't expect. This car then, it sits right at the moment where excitement stops and terror begins. That is Lambo land, that is. <laughs> Shit. So, the Urus looks and feels like a Lamborghini. It's also practical. The boot is massive. And inside, there's space for five six-footers. It's a nice place to be as well. And all that's great. Which leaves us with one more thing to answer. Is it a good laugh? What we've done is use a snowplow to create a racetrack on this frozen lake. And this is what we have planned. I'm going to try and overtake this. A four-wheel drive Porsche 911 Turbo, which is being driven by the Grand Tours racing driver, Abby Eaton. Have you seen this crack? I hadn't noticed that before. Look at the state of this. You're the heavier car, aren't you? Mmm, that's 2.4 tonnes, and I weigh half a tonne. Are you not worried about that? I haven't got my seatbelt on, so if it goes under, I can get out straight away. Seriously? Yep. Before the duel began, I had a few practice laps on my own. No! Drive carefully. Mm. Oh, keep your foot in it, man. Oh, look at that for a tidy line. Fast. That was excellent. Extremely good. It is quite scary through here. It may not be able to get as far up a ski slope as a Range Rover, but for doing this, it's better. <laughs> but would it be good enough to get past Abby in that Porsche? Mm, there she is. She is! <laughs> the bell has sounded, the race is on. Now we'd find out what's what on our specially designed track. Go. To make this car, Lambo's engineers had a good rummage around in Volkswagen's past bend. So the engine, a 4-litre V8, is from the Porsche Camaro. 
the rear axle and air suspension is from a Bentley Bentayga. The platform on which it sits and a lot of the dashboard is from an Audi SQ7. So does that mean this isn't really a Lamborghini at all? Get a bloody move on! is a bit twitchy, sort of thing you'd say to your doctor. For lap after lap, the big, heavy Urus clawed at the rear end of the 911 Turbo. Oh, God! Really? No! But eventually, I had to admit defeat. I can't get past that 911, and that's just an end of it. But I can keep up. And in an off-road car? That is fairly astonishing. It really is. Certainly, I can believe Lamborghini's claim that this is the fastest off-road car in the world. That was quite good fun. fun. Yeah, yeah, nice yeah. Day out. I got paid for that. That was your job. That was work. That was work. Yeah. Doing that is my work. <laughs> um, it probably won't be the fastest off-road car in the world for very long, though, because both Aston Martin and Ferrari have got uh, big SUVs coming out yeah. this year. Yeah, whatever. Thing is, could you really tell people that you have a Urus? Because it, it sounds like a minor alien out of Star Trek. Yeah. <laughs> but it does work as a Lamborghini. Yeah. But no. Well, this is excellent consumer advice. Yeah, I'm sadly... <laughs> very clear, very clear. The thing is, after I made that film, which was quite good fun, I came home and I thought, the trouble is, it could do with being a bit more Aventador-ish. It could do with being a bit more mad. Are you saying you changed your mind? Yes. Oh, great. So <laughs> Prime Minister Clarkson returns from the summit. I've declared war. But on the plane home, I had another think about it, and I'm not so sure now. I've changed my mind. Exactly. That's what I've done. Good. Well, since we're in such a sensible frame of mind, I'd like to move things on now um, with a brief history lesson. We're off. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Horsepower from one and a half litres. A 
and they were still going for 180 miles an hour. Thanks to its revolutionary monocoque chassis, the 25 was stiffer and lighter than any other F1 car, which meant it wasn't just fast on the straights, but quicker through the corners too. Go! Power, this is good. That is just the best. Try it now. <laughs> this really is genius. Oh, I was born to do this! And in the 1963 season, Clark used it to win a record seven out of the ten Grand Prix. Winner is Jim Clark. Nobody could possibly catch him now. But 1963 was just a warm-up for what was to come. To get a true picture of Clark's genius, we must look at another year. 1965. When he hit heights no driver had reached before, or has done since. A modern Formula One driver does 21 races a year and often complains that's too many. In 1965, Jim Clark raced in 63 races. Some of these cars look similar, but they are all completely different. In a car like this, he'd do Formula One championship. He raced in the British Formula Two championship and the French Formula Two championship in this car. He raced in the Tasman series, a sort of Australian Grand Prix for down under, in this car. And then there's this Lotus Cortina, in which he decided to race in touring cars. And then if all that wasn't enough, he decided to go for the Indy 500. First up was the Tasman series in Australasia. Out of the 15 races, Clark won 11 and took the crown. Then it was back to Europe for the British and French Formula 2 championships both of which he won. Jim Clark led from the start. Winner is Jim Clark. And in between the F2 races, he was jumping into his Lotus Cortina and racking up touring car victories. Go! Now this bit is really scary. Got to keep the pressure on. This is dangerous because of you. It's brilliant. Time to play. Don't look so bloody surprised. <laughs> there was America. The Indianapolis 500 has been called the greatest spectacle in racing. America's most prestigious race would be a tough challenge. Oval racing at higher average speeds than he was used to against seasoned Indy veterans. For the Indy 500, 
Clark raced a specially developed Lotus, producing just shy of 500 horsepower. However, although he already had a Formula One world title to his name, the Scotsman's CV cut no ice with the sniffy indie officials, who made the upstart from across the pond take a rookie driving test before he could compete. Go! Come on, come on, come on! Get your motor running in. How easy to get. An upstart from across the pond qualified on the front row. And then, in the race itself, Clark, up against America's finest oval racers, won by just over two minutes. Jim Clark, first European to win at Indianapolis since 1916, set a new record of 150.686 miles per hour. So what was it that made Clark so good? What was it that made him capable of winning in any type of car? Jimmy was an absolute natural driver, and he did it without thinking. He didn't know why he was driving in this style the way he did. In the period that we're talking about, we had one and a half litre cars, 200 horsepower. If you drove the car too hard, you would scrub the speed off. And if you lose a bit of speed, it's very difficult to actually make it up again. And that's what Jimmy had the knack of keeping the momentum of the car going. I don't think that any of the modern drivers could have driven the car anywhere near as quickly as Jimmy did, because he was just so precise. Go! Oh, I'm slightly alarmed. Right, let's go! ability to coach speed out of the car, Clark also possessed another fighting skill. In one of the major races I must die in Lotuses, because the Lotus was a very fragile car. But Jim Clark was so smooth that he never put too much stress on the areas of a car that would give up. But don't think for a minute that Clark was one of those drivers that could only win in a perfect car. One year at Spa, for example, he was leading the race when his gearbox started to let go. Did he give up? Nope. Instead, he drove the rest of the race, and we're talking 160 miles an hour in the wet, 
with one hand on the steering wheel and the other holding the gear lever in place. And he still won. By nearly five minutes. So let's just sum up Clark's season of 1965. Of the 63 races he contested, he won a staggering 31 of them and was on the podium a further eight times. He was now seen as the greatest racing driver of all time, in demand the world over. Yet this shy Scotsman chose to mark the year's achievements with a modest celebration at his hometown back in Scotland. The next two years, by contrast, were a disaster, with multiple mechanical failures denying him another championship. However, in 1968, driving the Lotus 49, another game-changer from Colin Chapman, Clark took the first win of the year in South Africa and looked set for another dominant season. Congratulations, Congratulations gentlemen. This is an absolutely splendid effort. OK, thank you very much. And then, on the weekend of April the 7th, Clark had a choice of two races he could compete in, one at Brands Hatch, the other a Formula 2 race at Hockenheim. Fatefully, he entered the German race. April the 7th is a, is a bad day for me. He wasn't happy. It was freezing cold and damp, misty. We could not get any heat into the tyres. Couldn't get any temperature in them, no matter what we did. Jimmy said to me, Father, I do not expect anything from me today. Just keep me informed with the pit board, where I am, how many laps to go. That's the last thing he said. On lap five, Clark's car suddenly speared off the track at 170 miles an hour. When he died, he was just 32, but in his short career, he had racked up some truly incredible achievements. In Formula One, he won 25 of his 73 races, which in percentage terms puts him way ahead of Hamilton, Vettel and even Schumacher. In pole positions, he had 33, which again in percentage terms makes him second best of all time, just behind Fangio. He was a benchmark. That was it. Most of what I was able to do in motor racing was done by the manner in which Jim Clark drove, and I just followed him. He was a gentleman. He was a gentleman and a gentleman. It's a pity he's not around now, because it'd be nice to have him. Truly amazing is how many championships he took part in. I mean, can you imagine Lewis Hamilton getting out of his Formula One car and saying, I haven't got time for any interviews because I've got to go off and do a touring car race? Exactly. Just wouldn't. And he so. did. The other thing that's worth remembering is back in the early 60s, if you went to Australia, if you flew to Australia, that meant eight stops. Yeah. And there were no flat bet. There weren't even any movies. Yeah, and it's let's just, not forget, he'd get, he'd get off that aeroplane, do a race, win it, obviously, then get on another aeroplane straight away to France to win a race there. No, it is astonishing. I mean, everybody has a favourite racing driver. I'm sure everybody here does as well. It's, you know, it's the Senna, Schumacher, Villeneuve, Romain Grosjean, <laughs> Fangio. <laughs> but if you use maths to measure a driver's greatness, you have to conclude... It was Jim Clark. Good night. Mm.